All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the uh, bi-monthly or semi-annual, whatever you want to call it, uh, hump day hangout with the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. I'm Brian Zeitz, the uh, first vice president of ISFSI. Uh, we have a good uh, cadre of guests today. Uh, we're going to be talking about training and data and uh, how data is critical for us in the training world and how we can uh, use that data to improve our training um, and that sort of thing. So uh, looking forward to today's discussion. I got, like I said, a great group of uh, people here today to discuss this. So I'm just going to go around, uh, have everybody introduce themselves, and we'll get this discussion started. So we will start with the um, Eddie Buchanan, former president of ISFSI. Uh, quick introduction. He's kind of our uh, go-to guy for this data discussion today. So uh, just a little background, Chief, and what, what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, uh, well, welcome everybody. My name is Eddie Buchanan. I'm a, a retired assistant chief from Hanover Fire DMS, uh, Richmond, Virginia. And now I work for an actual data analytics company uh, called Deccan International. We, we do uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics for fire departments. And uh, one of my kind of passions at the late has been uh, what I call data beyond the air break, uh, because a lot of the things that we, we measure in the fire service are from the time of the 911 call until the air break. Once we get everybody on scene to go, you know, get the air break hit, that's when all the clocks stop. You know, we kind of stop measuring there. So I've been very interested lately uh, in what happens after the air break. Like what, what's going on? Uh, what can we measure now? What, when would the technology catch up to us to help us automate some of that data collection? And then what does it mean? And particularly for something like the ISFSI, how does it start to influence uh, training and standards and things downrange? So I'm happy to be here. I look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just going around my screen. So we got Brian Gedemeyer. Brian Gedemeyer, <clears throat> Engine Company Captain, Cottonwell Fire Protection District, uh, just outside St. Louis, Missouri. Awesome. 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 Demond, sharpest dress man on the call. Good afternoon, folks. Demond Simmons calling in from Dallas Love Airport. Um, nice to be here. And just to piggyback off what Chief Buchanan stated, oftentimes when we think of data, we typically think of numbers. For folks that are listening or who will be listening, data, uh, in particular qualitative data, is just as important and can help us as it relates to all things training and education in the fire service. And with that, looking forward to today's discussion. Awesome. Awesome. Much appreciated. And of course, the guy with the best view of the house, uh, Chief Shaw down in Fort Lauderdale, he's always, always makes us jealous with yeah. that background. Yeah. This is true, and I will be unapologetic about the view and Florida and 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 everything going on down here. Absolutely, 100%. Um, uh, happy to be here, uh, Fort Lauderdale Fire Assistant Chief, uh, and uh, thank you, Demond, for not wearing a tie, and making us all look a little, little le le less dressed, I guess. So thank you for that, much appreciated. Um, excited for the conversation. Uh, data, unfortunately, is what we live in today, and everything we do is revolves around it. Um, and in my position as Assistant Chief, I'm sure you all can relate. I can't do anything without that supportive data. I, I need that for everything I do these days. And I've come to have a, a strange love for it, but um, it, it's good that we talk about it because it is something that's needed in our world and we can't get around it. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. No, absolutely. It, you know, to, to kind of piggyback off what uh, what Eddie was talking about earlier, you know, with that to the air break, I think to myself and, you know, in training, you know, in response times, that's what we, we matter, right? We, we, we benchmark to when we went out on the scene, and then basically the next time that we have benchmarked was when we went in service. And that's probably 90% of our calls. You know, you might have some other benchmark in there. And I think to myself in the EMS world, and trust me, I, there's, I always joke, there's three letters that aren't in Brian's eyes. It's EMS. And so um, I'm by no means the, the guru on this, but, but it seems like the medical world, the EMS side of it, it's getting a little better, right? Like they benchmark blood pressures every five minutes. They do, you know, when they gave a drug and that sort of stuff. And, and how do we, how in the fire service can we use some of that, those benchmarks they use and, and that sort of thing and, and make that the mindset. So, you know, I'll just start with Eddie, I guess. And, and what are you thinking in data terms of like, what are some things that we could be and should be looking at? Well, I, I, so the, the beginning of this, I guess, goes all the way back to the NFPA 1410, right? If you go look at that standard, um, the, the training for emergency scene operations, but there are a bunch of evolutions that are listed in that standard that have uh, times on them, like recommended time to completion. And I was on that committee for a number of years. And uh, 
you know, I, it, it, that that version of, of uh, content actually predated me being on the committee. But I asked around, I'm like, how did you how was how did we come to three minutes to be able to do this this one drill? And it was basically they just, you know, kind of took a whack at it. Right. Like they they went out and ran some drills. They had some, you know, some departments go do these drills and report back what their time, average times were. Um, they just kind of took a guess. And that's really all we have uh, to start from uh, when we when we start to look at this sort of thing. So, you know, I, the thing that made me start thinking about this was I noticed like in our old before I retired our department and for many years we had we had been reporting at patient. So we got on scene and then the next we would make a radio uh, benchmark just to go, hey, we're at patient and they make a note to CAD. And that's something that we can actually reach out and pull for reporting. So. Well, wait, if we could do at patient, what else could we do? Right. There's generating a fire stream. Like uh, how long does it take us to, to charge and, and flow our first attack line? Think, you know, things very simple and basic like that. And we're starting to see uh, some of the technology and things. Uh, I heard a briefing today from the U.S. Fire Administrator uh, where we were discussing artificial intelligence and uh the possibilities of even listen the, the, the computers can actually listen to the uh, radio traffic and pick out the verbal things we would say. So if we if we gave up, you know, water on the fire, if that becomes a, a term we're looking for inside of our uh, data metrics, it'll grab it. It can grab that time step, stamp it. So it, there's a whole host of things getting ready to happen with the technology catching up to us. And we haven't really started yet talking about what those things mean. Uh, first, what do we want to measure? I was on a call the other day with uh, Chief Dan Muncie, and I, I told him I was going to quote him because I thought it was so good what he said. He, he goes, it's important that we measure what's, we have to measure what's important. So that um, this is a great venue, this conversation here today is to talk about what is important. You know, what, what things should we be capturing? And what things can we not worry about? You know, so I, I don't want to hog the air too long, but I would. I'm interested to see what what everybody thinks. You know, what what if we had to say pick five things or something? What should we be measuring from a tactical perspective in a fire operation? No, I think that's that. that you know, it's interesting. You bring up 1410, right? So the three minute drills. And I always, you know, when you mentioned it the other day on your on the podcast, it was. I, I looked at. It, I'm like, you know, where did that come from? And I, and I immediately my head went straight to the four by four and eight by eight hole you know, and, and where did that come from? Well, it came from a sheet of plywood, right? And we all know the story and all that stuff now. And so, you know, you think about that and you're like, well, how is that still the case? Because no one's stood up and said, hey, I, I called nonsense and and that's mm -hmm. not how it should be. And and so, you know, it, and is 1410, three minutes, the same for every department. And I know that, you know, we could say, well, the fire's different, but we all work in different geographical demographic areas with different response plans. And so, you know, to those benchmarking and standards, maybe there are some variations and things like that. But um, that was an interesting question. So five things to measure, you know, uh, Demond, what do you think are some critical things? You know, you're in the training role at Oakland. You know, what are you what are you measuring now, if anything? And then what what do you think if you could measure if you had that, you know, crystal ball? Right. Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, answering the last question first in terms of what I think we should measure. I can honestly say I don't know at this point. And the reason um, what I'll say, what we need to get beyond measuring all the time is that we need to we need to get past measuring, stopping and starting with turnout time, response time, on scene time. Yes, getting on scene is important, but there are some other aspects that we need to look at. So not to get too eccentric here, but when we talk about data, uh, and I talk about the qualitative aspect observational data. And in the qualitative world, when we look at data that we collect, we make inferences from that data. And so if we were to look at start assessing data from a qualitative perspective and identifying some genes out of that data, I think that a better answer our question in regards to where we need to go. And since we were talking about EMS, when we look at EMS, EMS protocols come from data. It's not a doctor sitting in the lab or in an in a ivory tower who says that this is how we should treat a patient who, who has congestive heart failure. This is how we should treat a patient who is experiencing shortness of breath. It's based on patient care reports, 
other types of research activities that take place that our EMS protocols or algorithms that we use come about. So I would say part of our reset, part of our reimagining the fire service, part of our mantra of making data informed decisions is that we need to look at what we're collecting and start extracting some things from that. And I think that can tell us where we need to go. And I know that's a long, eccentric way of looking at it. You might say, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I'm going to go off on the limb and say, that is a approach, not the only approach, but a approach that we need to take so that we can come up with some new and creative ways of capturing data and making decisions off of that data and then moving forward with that. I, I, I like the analogy of the uh, the medical, right? Like I said earlier, and you brought that up, is, you know, all the changes that occur, you know, with ACLS, PHCLS, PALS, there's the, the, the alphabet of stuff we do in EMS is all based off data. And sometimes in the fire service, we lag behind that data because we either, one, don't want to believe it, or two, it it, it goes against what we've always done. And so, you know, that's, that's somewhat interesting that, you know, no one would ever argue if ACLS two years from now comes out and says, hey, when you get to the patient, the first thing you're going to do is, Put them on 100 percent action we all just change our protocols and put them on 100 action but if we change the fire service said the first thing you do on a fire is x because data says we'd all be like well hold on a second my my expertise says no that's not correct so it's kind of interesting how in the fire service we're smarter than they than the data sometimes may say so yeah i've had some experience with that <laughs> over the years yeah yeah i was gonna say and brian, and, <laughs> i was gonna say brian if you come back about a year or so now and ask me that question i'll have a better answer Right now, I'm getting ready to launch a uh, research effort titled Reimagining the 21st Century Fire Service Using Concepts from Smart Intelligent Cities um, Protocols. Um, so if you talk about this smart city concept, intelligent city concept, if we look at the fire service, reimagine the fire service in that lens, I think in the near future, that'll give us some data variables that we need to start putting in place and capturing data on. So what so tell us a little bit about that, Demond. What what is that what does that project entail? Yeah, so when we talk about smart cities and smart cities isn't necessarily always about technology, it doesn't start and stop with technology. It starts it actually starts and stops with people, but how do cities and this is more so from an urban planner perspective, academia perspective, and obviously us um, in all realms of local government, how do we do how do What's the best way to design cities from a 21st century perspective? Technology, innovation, and everything else, all that, that comes with that. And once we have a better understanding of what smart, what the smart city concept will look like, it will help influence the second quarter in the 21st century of the fire service. So that project is gonna look at some smart cities, not only here in the United States, but also internationally. And what's the nexus between a smart city and the public, excuse me, the fire service and how it's going to help us grow and evolve and what would be the next steps in terms of the fire service. And once again, broad, essential to do, but it is a way of us reimagining ourselves in the 21st century fire service. I look forward to a year from now getting that discussion on. That's going to be some great, great stuff to talk about. So Chief Shaw, you said you're assistant chief down there at Fort Lauderdale and everything you do is data driven. So what are you looking for in benchmarks in terms of, you know, data and, and if there's five things you can measure, you know, post air break say. Well, uh, I, th I go two different directions with this. One, I think the analogy to EMS is absolutely uh, critical for us to understand because um, you're right, they, the AMS has got it in certain ways, whether it's metrics on return of spontaneous circulation or cardiac arrest or stroke times or whatever, uh, the, the data is powerful there. And um, when you're going to a CQI meeting or some sort of meeting internal internally for ACLS or whatever, EMS related, that number, it, it, those numbers are, are definitely something to help you get better. In terms of um, the fire side of things, I like to think of things in terms of quantitative and qualitative. 
In other words, there's quantitative measures we can have that are number based and there's qualitative that are more just um, not number based. And I try to leverage that as best I can. So with the training we do, for example, um, in South Florida, we have a lot of challenges with hurricane rated structures. You go into one of our buildings down here, we typically do not have wood frame structures that are being built these days. We do occasionally and there's some that are out there, but typically our standard bread and butter operation is a single family, single story, CVS constructed, hurricane windowed, you know, heavily reinforced garage door structure, you know, things like that that are specific to our region. So how do we justify certain tools and equipment for those? Well, when we're doing training on our acquired structures, which we do a lot of, we were able to justify a lot of extra equipment based on our challenges. For example, the data we took back from all the acquired structures training we, do, we did recently, uh, several years ago, on a two-story um, apartment complex with hurricane windows all around, justified the need for us to buy things like nine inch rotary battery operated saws for second story VES operations, because I don't want them walking up there with a 26, 27 pound K-12. So things like that come into play. So trying to leverage the data you get, whether it's quantitative or qualitative from the training you do to justify expenditures, more training, uh, switches in, in, in your cash of equipment, that's valuable. When you talk to these people that are penny pinchers and, and number crunchers, they need to hear that for justification sometimes. Um, going back to more saw work, for example, we had a, a series of saw blades that we tested internally R&D, and we were able to measure through videos and stopwatches which blade performed better than the others. So when you bring that information to the logistics and say this one performed best, here's all the data to support it, there's no questions after that. Oh, you guys did the research. Copy that. Thank you. These are, they're going to need that information to justify it to their bosses. So you're helping that. And when you start doing that as a norm, it becomes a standard. You're, you're watching other people come to your classes. You see them taking the information and take the data and utilizing it. It's not just about coming through the training. There's more to it than that. So my mind goes to those two areas, the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, uh, so it, that's where my mind goes in general. But that, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I try to I guess the summary is I try to leverage all the training we're doing and what we're seeing in the field in terms of the calls we run to justify tools, equipment, staffing, the whole nine yards. No, I like it. I, I think that you know, the quantitative qualitative aspects of it, you know, in terms of data collection is, is critical. And I do appreciate you uh, somehow bringing saws into the conversation. Amazing how I do that, right? It's, 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 it's just, it's, a, it's, it's phenomenal how like you twist it from EMS <laughs> to saws. I love that. It's, it's just like, wow, that, that was like a smooth transition. So Brian, oh, very diverse, very diverse, <laughs> very diverse, incredible transitionable ways. So Brian is a, is a truck captain, right? So like, you know, we're talking about data and, and the use of data for decision making and purchasing, you know, as a truck captain, what, what data in terms of training are you using, you know, to improve your crews or what would you like to see to have quantitative actual or qualitative data that would help you as a captain? Brian might have gone on a call. That's all right. He was working today, so he might be on a call. So, Eddie, what do you think in terms of your your top five? You know, you you said that you asked the question. What what would you be looking for, or what are you thinking? <clears throat> I am typically I like the idea of uh, evidence based operations, right? So, I, I guess if you started it at the bread and butter, what are the things that make the most difference? Uh, with saving lives and property. And I think uh, one of those things is initiating uh, primary search of how fast we can begin that, whether it be through uh, the front door or window, or however we want to go at it. Um, and then how, how fast can we generate water? If I was looking for low hanging fruit, these would be the things that I would look for. Um, they're fairly easy to capture. Uh, the technology is kind of almost there now. What's happening with the tech is all that all that data is siloed in the, its own little lane, right? So your SCBA knows when it was turned on. It knows, you know, it has a lot of uh, information already baked into it, but it's it's over there. It's not over here. You know, it's, there's some things that have to happen. But I think over the next two years, um, we'll be able to solve a lot of that. So I'm looking at water. I'm looking at search. Uh, Ventilation is something to consider. Uh, I know the pumps, the, uh, the fire apparatus now have the capability to uh, capture a lot of data. 
um, with the, you know, whether it be when the pump was engaged or what sort of GPM flow they might have had. I don't know if that's five or not, but it's pretty close. You know, I mean, if, if we started with the very basics of what we do and, uh, and try to capture some of that, and then we can start to understand, we can go back to, to things like 14, 10 and update those numbers maybe. You know, that maybe three minutes is, is not realistic or maybe it's too long. You know, we can start to have some uh, awareness of that. And then, I, you know, like I said, the, the, as we evolve with CPR over the years, we would start to evolve with the things we do in the field. And th think of how this would inform uh, like FRSI, right? If they have access to this information coming back and the ability to uh, tailor the research around what, what's going on operationally, it'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I think of myself, like just from a training perspective, like to your point, you know, the 14 tendrils and things like that. But, you know, how long does it take for the average company, you know, and, and gather this data, right? Or, you know, do some type of survey, get some data. How long does it take to get a line to, to a first floor kitchen fire? How long does it take a line to get flowing to a second floor bedroom fire? How long does it take for a primary search to be completed of a 1600 square foot structure, a 2000 square foot structure, single fan, single story, two story. And then, you know, using some of that to say, okay, well, on a first alarm assignment, we're bringing X number of, you know, in my area, we don't have trucks and engines, but, you know, for, for you guys in the cities and stuff, like how, how many engines are you bringing? Are you bringing enough trucks? I mean, and, and does that response need to be modified such that, because, you know, it, we want to get it done quicker. And if I, if, you know, if I bring in this many trucks, does it get my searches done quicker or does less trucks bring in, get it done quicker because now I don't feel tripping on me. So, you know, a, a really good example that this came to mind was uh, gallons for fire attack. We 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 typically we bring enough water to flood the place, right? Usually, and but when we look at the studies, we're seeing we're seeing a room or two, you know, a, a fairly well involved building uh, is being controlled with typically less than a couple hundred gallons of water. So how does that influence where you put your staffing and how do you, where you're focused? Do we I, I've per, you know, personally uh, been a part of burning buildings down because we were messing around with water supply. We wouldn't have made any difference. And anyway, you know, do we, do, as I, we had an old uh, battalion chief uh, who's passed away now from cancer, but uh, he, he, he would call it beaching the tanker. He would say, just beach it. Like, you know, run it up on the beach yeah. and leave it. And uh, we would, that was a, a tactic that he developed just from his own experience. And now we see that he was right as we start to see the data come back from the research. So. But we still don't know what the answer is. I grew up in the era of we had we had uh, GPM uh, calculations, right? You know, length times width times height divided by three times percent involvement, and that told you how much water you needed. When you look at what the what the science is coming back with, those numbers are way way out from, from what we are finding out today. So, I mean, water usage is something. Put that in the top five, right? Like, and then how does that influence tactics? Do we how do we approach uh, laying that line in every time? And does, does it change? I don't know if it, I don't know what it means operationally yet, but it, it shows me that what we thought we knew back then was not accurate, really, based on what we're seeing today because of the data. And Brian, no, this sorry. is, um, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. This, go ahead. Is great, and this is a great discussion for the simple fact is, uh, in my current position right now, support services, and we're working on this initiative in Oakland is identifying some key performance indicators. Key performance indicators, just a fancy term for what things, activities that we do that are critical to our mission statement. And so when we look at the fire service, we look at things such as line of duty deaths. We know cancer, behavioral health are some big, big issues that we're dealing with asking the question, what kind of data should we be collecting? What should we be observing in observational data format to help us curtail some of these issues of cancer in the fire service and mental health issues that we're dealing with? Yes, firefighting is important, has, has been important, will continue to be important, but are we looking at the right data, especially when we're talking about saving the lives of professional firefighters? across the world. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I, you know, it's, 
I think that's the key. It's like, right. Is we have to, we have to make sound decisions off of good data. And, you know, are we collecting good data right now? To a certain degree, I say yes. And to a certain degree, I say we're probably missing the boat. And as you said, Chief Munson the other day, you know, collect what's important, you know, or, or to get the data for what, what really matters. And so, you know, sometimes we, we put our benchmarks, you know, on the, where are we at 20 minutes into a scene or, you know, hey, primaries check that box type thing versus actually, you know, I always thought that was interesting, right? Like fires under control. We typically benchmark that, but we don't benchmark water on the fire so that we don't know, to your point, it, do we need a sufficient water supply or do we need a sustained water supply? You know, because there's a big difference, right? One's going to take some time. And, you know, in these drills and things like we do with trainings, I think that's a critical factor, right? Like, you know, especially in a rural water supply situation where you're going to set up a drop tank or you're going to have a nursing operation, that takes a, a amount of time that that crew is no longer going to be available for other fire ground operations. So I think gathering that data and having those those in your head as, as an incident commander or, or first ground, or first arriving officer is going to allow you to make a better decision, right? And that's what the end of the, at the end of the day is what we always, we want. So, um, you know, that's critical. I don't know if Brian got back on here yet. If, if Gettemeyer's back, he was going on. He, he said he'd be back in a few seconds. We'll get his perspective on. He, he on. is not back on yet. He is not back. Okay. No worries. No worries. Easy enough. All right. So, so Steve, you talked about doing some training down there in Fort Lauderdale and things like that with, you know, the saws and obviously some of your operations and stuff to, to allow you to make purchases of equipment. Has, has any of your training and the, and the data you've collected changed your operations in terms of your deployment of resources or your, your or or those things, or had you increased or decreased assets responding or any of those things? Well, I, I tell you that's a, that's a that's a hell of a question. Let me try to let me try to figure. Well, let me let me start here. Um, I think that there's a lot of value in being intentional. And this kind of goes back to some of what you guys were talking about in terms of the data we're looking for. I think being intentional about uh, certain metrics is powerful. For example, uh, the former training chief of of our organization. Uh, said it very clear that, you know, one of the drills he was going to do that he had the, the as a monthly drill was mask up. So he did mask up in less than 30 seconds. And it seems like a small thing, but it's not. The drill was, you know, correcting things we they saw in the field. So you have the traditional, um, what do they call it? Like the, the praying in the yard where you're sitting down in front of you on your knees and you're looking down, getting your mask on. Well, the training bureau was trying to, to deviate from that and have you do it standing up. Um, have the longer neck strap around your mask and timing you to make sure you're doing it the right way and not timing to uh, for any like negative part of it, but just to set a standard. And the fact that they knew, oh, 30 seconds is the benchmark because there was a benchmark out there that was powerful. And now when we see videos of our folk out there fighting fires, because we've had a, a, a good run of fires. When they see the videos, they're practicing what they learned in training. And you can see the intentionality that they're out. They're standing up, they're putting their mask on real quick, just like they were taught in the training and they're going to work. So there's a lot of power in setting expectations. And the time of that is, is also powerful too, as a metric, not only as a metric for the training purposes, but as a reminder, they remember it. The same thing on the medical side. We did some training earlier this year and uh, we altered our cardiac arrest protocol to keep them on scene for six minutes minimum while they get everything done. In other words, don't treat it like a cardiac or don't treat it like a trauma alert. Stay in play, get things done. Don't rush. I mean, studies are showing how better we're doing in the field treating cardiac arrest uh, than we ever had before. So now uh, we're telling them stay a little longer. And because we set a number, people remember the number. So numbers are powerful. So when you're intentional about de of deploying those numbers, make it well known to your crews what you're looking for, setting the expectations, and then training appropriately, you start to see results. So I think that's pretty powerful. It's a good tie between the training you're doing and the results you see in the field. And in both those examples I gave you, we the, the, result, the results were immediately seen. And that's very, very powerful to the training bureau. It's very powerful to the department. And it sets a tone. Oh, if we can do that, what else can we do? What else can we do to deploy around whatever we're talking about to see the same results? So that's kind of where my mind goes to in terms of, of uh, expectations and, and metrics. So you brought the cardiac arrest and made me think of something not related to a call, but I'd like to ask Eddie, this is like, so training, right? So unfortunately we lose firefighters to training, you know, cardiac arrest sometimes and things because we're not measuring real time data in terms of, of their, their, you know, vital signs and that sort of thing. So 
where do you see that playing out in the future? You know, it, with with, the, with your crystal ball. Yeah, it's been a little bit of a soapbox issue for me here lately, um, and it stems from a couple of line of duty deaths we've seen in training, where you know firefighters were buttoned up doing some kind of drill, went into a medical emergency, and there was some question uh, about the instructor's role in in those deaths. And initially, it wasn't looking so great. But then, the, when the final report came out, we we I, I didn't see anything that. I thought the instructors were doing what they could do, you know, based on the information they had. Um, the wearables now are getting to the point where um, they can, there is some telemetry and, and things that we can get some of that data. The question we have to figure out as a fire service is related to the privacy of that information. You know, uh, is everybody going to be okay with me knowing their, their, pulse rate and blood pressure and all that. I, I don't need to know their medical history necessarily. You know, I'm, more, I'm more, mostly interested in their vitals in that activity and, and would be okay even if, some, if a doc someplace set a threshold that would alarm if they exceeded or, or decreased, you know, fell below. Um, but that's one of the hard parts we have to talk about in the fire service is uh, figuring that out because the technology exists for us to do that. Um, it, I don't think it would be terribly expensive. But we have to get over the hump of the privacy of the of the health information and and where's that line in between? Uh, you know, I, I would love to see the unions and the and the uh, management and everybody get together and really have a hard conversation about what does that look like, so that we could uh, then we could talk to the tech providers to get us the tools we need to be able to measure those things. But I man, when somebody's buttoned up with an SCBA on and they're down in a prop somewhere. If they don't communicate to me that they're, you know, in some sort of medical emergency, I don't know. I can't tell. You know, I can hear breathing and I can see them crawling around, but um, I really don't have a way to really know if they're having a problem. So, you know, it's it's uh, there's some big baseline questions we have to answer as a fire service as a whole first to be able to get some progress on that. But it's frustrating because the technology exists to do it now. That, that, you know, uh, I want to pick up my I want my iPad over here so I can I can look and see what everybody's uh, just show me green and red, man. You know, yeah. are they good or are they not? That's all I'd care about. I can uh, post that or not. Yeah. Yeah. So it will it's it's a challenge, but I think we'll figure you know, one of those things we have to figure out. Uh that's what the society is is all about, you know, t- tackling the big elephants and getting them to get to some sort of uh answer. Do you foresee in, in, you know, I'll ask both of you guys this question. Do you see, obviously technology is, is, is driving the fire service, right? I mean, we know that there's just technological changes that are changing every day. It's driving society as a whole. Do you see that impacting with the, some of the data points that we could potentially want to collect affect equipment? And what I mean is a Bluetooth nozzle that will send back when it was open or closed, you know, and, and, and is there going to become a point to your point? To where people are going to be like, "Hey, listen, you're you're getting too much data off of my mind and decision making I'm making in a fire." It's not that far off now. Um, the The technology exists now to to give us situational awareness that would be, we would think, it was science fiction five years ago. You know, it's, it hasn't necessarily trickled into uh, mainstream operations at this point, but. I, I'm at a conference now where I just I just saw a lot of this technology. You know, these people are here that are doing the X, Z, X Y, and Z tracking and, and uh, being able to show us, you know, the, the basic shapes inside of a smoke filled building to, that we can locate where firefighters are. We can pick up their uh, biometrics uh, through all this transmission. I mean, it's already there. We just we are not ready to be able to manage that data necessarily yet, but the science is there to collect it. It's just in a bunch of silos. So, you know, over the next, uh, with Neris coming on, uh, line over the next couple of years, um, that will function very much like a data kind of warehouse where you can come in with multiple data sources and then you can, uh, th- those can be baked into something that's usable. That's probably where you're going to see that to start hitting mainstream is once that gets launched. I just saw a presentation from the U.S. Fire Administrator a couple hours ago on that on that very topic. So, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're getting close, but we've, we've got some, 
things to work out and start having those discussions. And that's why I think it's important that, you know, folks that are listening to this now, we want you to be part of the discussion. You need to be part of the discussion, you know, so that we get it right. We got kind of one shot at this, you know, it's going to one big sweeping change of, of, of technology and a focus on data. If we can get this right, it, it can really be awesome. It can really give you the tools you need to do your job more effectively and safer. So. Yeah, I know that, uh, and I wasn't obviously the presentation this morning, but I, I know with that new system, I mean, there's it's pretty encompassing in terms of data collection and, and not just for like what we traditionally would thought of as an in-first product, but, you know, training and and how we actually document training and, and collect the data for training and things like that. So um, to your point, I, you know, if, you, if you're if you're sitting in the stands, it's time to stand up and be part of the, uh, be part mm -hmm. of the team on, on getting this thing done. So uh, we got Brian back, so we'll talk to Brian real quick. And, in terms of data collection and, and what you look for in training, right? So we've heard qualitative, quantitative, um, you know, uh, Shaw was talking about some of that stuff and, and, and different things. What are what are benchmarks you're looking for from a training perspective that would be data points that you would want to have as a, as a company officer on a truck to impact your training at the company level and your crew? I mean, we had kind of talked about it a little bit uh, right before I had a leave to go on a call. Um, we were talking about the data points of water on fire and, and how quick we deploy a hose line. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is, I don't, I don't know what's an acceptable answer on time because we had never collected that data. So, you know, as a company officer, when I do training, I kind of get into that feels right, right? That I feel like that's the right amount of time it took us to force the door. Or I think we can do it a little faster and we practice again. Um, so I don't have that benchmark. So Eddie had talked about 1410. And the benchmarks there, and and I like the fourteen ten because it tells me how fast, you know, what's what's a, what's an average time to deploy that line or to hook up a hydrant and all that. And I don't I don't know those points as a captain. I know what feels right. I know what um, I know when my company feels like we're we're doing well on a day, and some days where it's like oh we're dragging a day. But it'd be interesting to, to see that data and say no where you're doing it in a minute and a half, we should be doing that in 45 seconds. Um, the fire ground's not getting any slower, right? Um, you know, my dad was a firefighter and, and he talks about fire behavior in minutes. Um, and I talk about it in seconds. Uh, so, so likewise, I, I need to be more efficient on the fire ground. Um, so, so I, I look forward to the data on, um, how quick it does take us to deploy a handline, how quick we should be to the seat of the fire, how quickly we should uh, um, be conducting a primary search in a 2000 square foot ranch house. Um, but but all I know is what feels right. I, you, I can't give you an answer on, on time. I had made the, I made the comment to a couple of people the other day after a, a podcast and it was actually Eddie's podcast on this, on the state of topic. And I said, it'd be interesting to go around, you, you know, and, and Brian and I work in, neighboring counties to go around the stations and just say okay you know i'm just gonna i'm just gonna watch you and so now you have a call and say it's a, i'll just say hey you gotta you know go to brian station and say hey your company's just got a first alarm up and there's the tones just hit and time them how long it takes them to get to the truck time them how long it takes to get the gear on how long is it then have them just drive to the training tower it's not timed how long does it take them to get off the truck and get masked up? How long does it take them to get the hose line off the truck? How long does it take them to get the water, you know, aligned to the second floor? And do that at various stations around the county in multiple counties in the St. Louis area and just see exactly what it is, right? I mean, is it 35 seconds? Is it two minutes? I mean, we don't, none of us know, but at least have that benchmark and say, okay, is, is that then acceptable? Yes or no? And then conduct training off those data points to improve. Because maybe maybe the maybe the problem is not getting the hose off the truck to the fire. Maybe it's getting guys motivated that hey, you know, get up and get out of the seat faster. You know, I, I don't know, right? We don't know. Um, it's important to understand the big picture too, right? So if what you'll see as we migrate to this new reporting system, new da new data system, I'll call it. Uh, yeah. As we start to as we start to collect uh data over the years like all the things you just said brian you know all these benchmarks and i measured them over a, over a large group of people and over a large span of time we start to accumulate uh some some things we could gain some historical insight from to understand what those trends should be like what are the norms like what's really good performance and what's substandard performance and where 
Where should the average and be? You know, where, where should all that be? What should it look like? But the other part of that is when you go forward in a time, look, so once we say we've accumulated five years of that data, we, we measured those things for five years across those groups. We now have enough historical understanding that we can start to make predictive or, or simulate operations in a virtual environment. So the, these PhDs I work with are, are facing, these data scientists are a trip what they can do because they can, it, 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 I would, we would recognize it as what like Madrakowski and Kerber do when they uh, mod, do fire modeling. They, like we've had a line of duty death or near miss, they can go in and take the dimensions of that building and simulate that fire development so that we can see it, right? Well, we could do something similar to that uh, using what they call digital twins. It's like a virtual, a virtual version of the buildings you have in your community. If we had that operational data that you have collected all those years doing all those things, we now have the ability to simulate how your fire department would, would respond in various conditions under the, the building structure, the, we could look at all sorts of different uh, obstructions or you know, operational hurdles you might have to overcome. And we can use some of the fire modeling to go with that. So it would be like seeing a fire, like something that Madrakowski or, or Kerber did to do fire modeling. Imagine if we could do the same thing, modeling your operations. But you can't do that until you have the, histor the historical uh, data collection to back that up. We, we do all the predictive analysis from the historical data. To, to take what we know and then look forward. So until we start collecting it, we're, we're, we're still at zero, you know, as far as the ability to do any, any of the things like that, where we started to get into simulations. And uh, imagine what we could do, you know, like we, they already can do some pretty cool stuff with like uh, floods and, uh, you know, hurricanes, you know, things weather related, uh, some, some wildfire modeling and things like that. They, that, that capability already exists because the historical data is there. So the challenge for us is to start, uh, you know, it starts with the basic skills and that usually starts with the instructor. And, and where can we put that? How can we collect that data? Um, how, where would it live? And, and then we can start to draw conclusions and, and do some experiments with that data. So we have to, you know, it's like chicken or the egg kind of thing, but until we start really, uh, catching some of those things. I was just looking over here years ago. There was a, we had a battalion chief. His name was Henry Moore, who's also passed away from cancer. Um, may he rest in peace, my old friend. And uh, he did a, he did a study years ago. We grabbed an old warehouse and we uh, massive open area uh, search kind of situation. And we took fire. We didn't let anybody, it was kind of a secret. Nobody, you know, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't stay secret long. Yeah. But when we started moving companies around, nobody knew it was coming. And uh, they were they just showed up at this place. We got them on on air, took them out in the middle of this warehouse, spun them around about 20 times, got them good disoriented and let them go. And let's just see how they solve this problem. And they were out in the middle of thousands of square feet of warehouse, you know, with with no way to orient. And he collected some pretty cool data. That's why I was looking to see if I could find the report. I have it someplace um, where we looked at things like uh, how many how many out of the groups we tested, how many called a mayday right out of the gate? And then the number was terrible. Like we 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 did a whole bunch of follow-up training based on the information we got from that drill and collecting this certain benchmarks. Did they call a mayday? How did they we we looked to see how did they find some sort of orientation that we saw all over the map behavior? You know, we 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 saw some people just get up and start running. I saw one guy run slam into a pole. We, we, you know, I did, we, we were so struck that he just got up and started running. We thought, what? And because you can't see anything, you know, their mask is waxed out. And uh, I was like, where is he? Pow, right in the pole. But anyway, um, we saw people take uh, tools out of their pockets, start throwing them to try to sound for a wall. I saw one guy pick up the crack in the cement, the expansion joint in the cement. And he goes, well, I figured it goes to a wall. Okay. You know, it was, it was uh, a lot of interesting lessons we got from that. And that's a good example of, you know, calling a mayday. You you clearly are lost, you know, so right out of the gate, that should have been the first thing that that, that should have happened. And most people didn't do it. So we did a bunch of follow-up training uh, on that drill based on the data. So you really, I'll, I'll have to find it and share it with you guys. Uh, it, it's in this file somewhere. 
it's interesting you say that we just did some uh, large commercial operation training and similar. And so, you know, same thing, right? Send a company in, you know, the purpose was to get six, seven companies in this building all operating together in a large commercial. And of course, you know, run out of air and things like that are recurring. And it was interesting to your point, what you're talking about, guys, we literally saw guys that were, you know, very competent firefighters, but as soon as they started getting low on air in that no visibility environment, it was, it, it, it wasn't May days and things they were calling. Some of them did, but a lot of them were just, I'm on my own. Like I got to save myself. And like, you know, they left either a crew or they told their crew, Hey, listen, and they, they're bypassing other firefighters just to try to figure out their way out and stuff. So it made me as an instructor really look at it and say, wow, like this is what would have happened, right? Like if they were really in this situation in a real commercial building, these are what you're going to do. If not, maybe even worse. Right. Um, so yeah. And I think to myself too, like when you talk about data and the, in the collection of data, what we're collecting as instructors, most of the time, our data sets are what we need for, it sounds terrible, but ISO, right? Like I got to have so many ISO hours. So I'm going to classify this training as that. I'm going to put them in as hours. I'm going to put the class title. I'm going to put who attended. And, and then from a training officer perspective, check the box, right? And, and so, and then next year's comes along and I got to put that training schedule out there. I'm like, okay, well, we got to get these many ISO hours because I got to maintain that ISO rating. And, uh, and is any of that truly driving improvement in our organizations in the fire service or even producing highly effective quality training that's going to improve the fire ground? And so, I don't know. I think it's interesting as heck, uh, especially now that like, you know, with, with what you're doing and things like that, the data has got to be coming to us in the fire service, not so much in, in a pen and paper format that we're collecting on our own, but in a format that, you know, we don't even know we're collecting it because then it'll really be true and, and we'll actually be able to use it um, to really drive some, some real key decisions, I think in the future. So I don't I've, know. I've seen some of that AI work. Um, it, it's already uh, available. It's not widely, you know, uh, not widely used yet, but I, I saw it at the IC. Um, I went out to the fire station of the future and went down there and saw my buddies at 3 a.m. And, and they're, they're the ones that are, they're kind of incorporating this technology, but you literally, I saw they did a demo for me where they, uh, we, we got ready, you know, he, he goes, I'm going to say the magic word. So it's like, you know, saying, hey, you know who will be your phone. And uh, when he said the word Mayday, the, the thing heard it and activated the alarm uh, automatically just because he said it. So uh, imagine uh, the thing, it was going to require some discipline and some training on our part. Like, what are the things we're supposed to say? When are we supposed to say it? Yeah. But that data collection can be automatic. You know, you don't have to, it's not re necessarily relying on the dispatcher to make a note, the CAD, they may or may not, or put it in incorrectly. Um, the, the system is doing that, you know, on its own. So you can simply say things over the radio or even it wasn't even over the radio. It was just a, a, a device heard it and recorded that piece of information and responded to that piece of information. So, you know, you can just be saying things verbally as you're operating in a fire and, and it's going to catch it, record it and take action if programmed to. Uh, so. I mean, think of the. Well, that that'll send you back to your tactical guidelines to think about it. Well, you know, like, well, yeah. what what benchmarks do we need to record? And um, you know, when you're making your size up, if you said things out loud, it would record the things you're seeing. You know, there's not to mention if you're wearing some sort of camera. I think we got to we've got to talk to our uh, our legal departments about these cameras because while I appreciate the, the, them trying to manage the liability, I also think there's valuable information that we're missing. That you know, we we back in the early fire dynamics days, I, I was pushing hard to get some cameras because I wanted to try to catch people doing it right. When most of the time is what you saw on social media was people doing it maybe not so right. So we were looking, you know, trying to do that, and then we of course the attorneys show up and they're like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. So we we have to find a way to overcome that, you know, so that uh, that information would be there because it's not as the as uh, Dr. Lori said this morning. It's not, we, we think of data as, as stamps and benchmarks and numbers, but it could be a photo, it could be a, a video. There's lots of different ways we can capture information with the new technology that will be available to us over the next, you know, it, it'll look completely different in five years from now. So we have to start, have those discussions now at the field level. It's important that the firefighters are talking about this and telling us what's important 
uh, you know, to what benchmark should we be looking for? Uh, if we had the ability to capture you saying something, uh, God help us with what we might say in the cab of a truck or something. We'll have to figure that out. But, um, you, you know, there's that, that could be pretty cool. And we could capture a whole lot of stuff if I just had to say something. Yeah, I think it's in, in the automation process of it, right? So it, it's got to be self-automated. And, and like you said, this and, and, and the cameras, you know, you know, I used to have a helmet camera and I would notoriously never turn it on just because I was one less. I just wasn't used to it. Right. It, but, yeah. you know, it's uh, like, yeah. you know, when the door opens or the SCBA turns on, you know, linking those things together. And, I, you know, to your point earlier, like you're working with a bunch of PhDs and, and, and luckily we have you in that in that spot. Right. So you're advocating on what the fire service needs. Mm-hmm. But if we're not part of this discussion. Then those benchmarks or data points are what they think is important. And, yeah. and they can do it, right? They know the technology. They they can make that happen. We have to be the ones in the fire service telling them these are the things that are important to us and things we want to start looking at and, and capturing. So I'll, look, we're kind of wrapping up at the end of the hour. So I kind of want to ask one last question to you. What do you think is going to be the biggest thing over the next five years? Well, broad question. I think <laughs> it, it, the thing that's going to, have the most impact will be nearest. That's what the new reporting system is called. So um, they're going to uh, shut down infers, and that bad boy is just going to be gone away. And there's not much in the fire service that literally hits every fire department like that. You know what I mean? We're we're all pretty much in there reporting on that. So um, I think it will be. Uh, I, when I was first asked the question of what I thought about this initiative, I said it is absolutely long overdue, and I think it's a great initiative. And Lord, it's going to be a mess. You know, it's it's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of challenges for us to overcome because it's something so different. Your FDID number will will go away, and you'll get a new number, and and you'll report it in a different way. But instead of having to go back to the firehouse and, and try to figure out how to bring up as few screens as possible in the reporting system, you could probably do it on your phone own right there at the fire, you know, and you could probably document what you're seeing right there with that device. So that's going to be probably the big deal because in the next five years that will be rolled out. And uh, I, I, like I said, I can't think of anything that have a broader reach than that. Um, I hope we are able to take the technology and use it and make use of it in a, in a productive way. You know, you know how we tend to I, I use thermal imagers as, a, as an example where when they first came out, we were a little bit like not sure what to do with it. Remember that big thing you had to wear in your head and all that? And then uh, the technology improved. And then then we got a little bit maybe too leaning on it a little bit too hard, you know, particularly with the early versions of those cameras. They, they would, you know, the battery, my battery was always going dead and stuff, you know. Um, so you had to make sure that you relied on the basics, not just the tool. Uh, to, to know where you are oriented in a building and those types of things. Um, so we have, a, we have a tendency to want to p- pendulum swing things, you know, like we're a little resistant, then we go way over here with it, and then we finally get it somewhere in the middle where it's supposed to be. Um, we, hopefully we're, we can be thoughtful as we roll these things out. And uh, I, you, this is something we should all be paying attention to because I, I know the intention is for firefighters to have input and for it to be as useful as possible uh, for the safety and well-being of our firefighters and our ability to serve our communities. That That is the intention. We have to be paying attention from the firefighter level, you know, to, to make sure we're showing up. When, when, when they're asking the questions, we got to show up and give some answers, you know. So um, it's something you want to be paying attention to. And it's not just fire chiefs. I'm talking to battalion chiefs, captains, lieutenants, and, and firefighters riding in the jump seat should all be talking about this and talking about what's important and, and funneling that into the to the uh, stakeholders that have the ability to actually make that difference. You know, so I don't, I haven't seen anything that big in a long time. You know, it's, um, I'll be, it, that's up there with, with the whole fire dynamics uh, research initiative anyway. You know, it's, we've been doing a lot of change in here in the last 20 years and uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's just getting started. Yeah, I think that's gonna be crazy. I think the uh, you know one platform to uh, to conduct reporting on uh, that's funded through the federal government, right? That that that's what you're gonna go to is going to be a, a tradition, a true game changer for uh, not just fire, but yeah. emergency services reporting uh, across the board and how we how we truly collect data. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I will say is is I just 
you know, with technology going where it's at, I just hope that I hope technology doesn't override the basics. And so guys mm-hmm. so engrossed in technology with drones and technology stuff that we forget how to force a door because those basic skills are still fundamentally needed on today's fire ground. So it's, a, it, you know, it's a balancing act, I think. And I, you know, I think that uh, as a fire service, we just have to do a good job of that. So um, we're wrapping up right at an hour. So I just want to appreciate uh Thank you, everybody, for their time. And we had a couple of guys jump on and off. Uh, a couple of guys had calls. A couple of guys had to uh, get to some meetings. But uh, thanks to Eddie for jumping on here with us today, talking about technology and data. Always great to have him on here. Um, we want to uh, give a big thanks to Clarion and Fire Engineering for uh, sponsoring the ISFSI on this, uh, like I said, monthly uh, hump day hangout. Um, FDIC, uh, we just wrapped it up in April, which is crazy to think. It was just a couple months ago. But the FDIC call for papers is out until June 24th. So if you are uh, thinking about submitting, uh, definitely get your submission in. Um, it's always helpful to write an article. So if, you, if you're if you passionate about a topic in the fire service, it might be training, might be data collection, technology, whatever. Um, put your thoughts on paper, submit it to fire engineering, and uh, who knows, you might be published in their uh, magazine online or one of their forums. So um, that's how most of us all got our start before we uh, ever got to FDIC. So put your thoughts out there. Definitely helps your cause for uh, getting accepted into FDIC. So um for the ISFSI and all the guests here today, we definitely appreciate everybody listening and uh, everybody stay safe. Thank you.